It is our pleasure to be able to present this unique program to the community. Many of you may have been here back in the fall of 2015 when I had the opportunity to um, meet a man named Lyle who came up to me in the children's area. <laughs> he overheard me talking because I was trying to figure out programming. What kind of programs to bring into the community? And I don't have a big budget. Let's say I have none. <laughs> so um, I happen to be stand, is standing there talking on the phone or talking to someone. And so this guy comes up and he goes, uh, I've like been on television. <laughs> I've like written a book. I've like, uh, you know, I might be interested. And so I'm. <laughs> I went, right, you're going to be interesting, okay, and he is, and I was plugging his name into the computer going, my gosh, he's for real, and so that was really cool, and so that's the beginning of, a, a, well, I guess you'd call it a hometown boy, mm -hmm. being able to give back to the community, because Lyle lives here in Bedford, and it is my pleasure for the as a representative of the Bedford Public Library to welcome Lyle Blackburn. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, this is an encore performance. This is my second time here at the library, and this is my favorite event because I just live around the corner. <laughs> I speak about this all over the country, and you know, uh, trying to fly to these events and take my massive merchandising stuff and not to mention that the Bigfoot tracks it gets quite to, quite the challenge to uh, travel around with that stuff so this is a pleasure just to drive over here and like she said give back to the community uh, in a unique way um, because that is me but uh, I was born and raised in Euless and I, I lived in Dallas for years but uh, eventually returned here to Bedford and uh, it's, a, it's a very great library and we come here often uh, and so it's great to uh, have you all here. Now, the computer shut off just about the time, see I told you about this, uh, this situation of uh, technology. There we go. Curse of Bigfoot, yes. So what I talked about last time I was here, if there was anybody here, I did a discussion on the history of Bigfoot sightings in Texas. Um, and of course that may be news to many people, but if you follow this subject, uh, you're probably aware that there's Bigfoot sightings many places around the United States, not just in the Pacific Northwest. And of course shows like Finding Bigfoot have made this more well known because they travel around and they have witnesses come forward and tell their stories. Um, I initially, my first book was called The Beast of Boggy Creek and what I've done here is sort of expand on that topic. So what I'm going to talk about is part of my latest research which is uh, encompasses my, my new book called Beyond Boggy Creek in Search of the Southern Sasquatch. Now how many folks have seen the old movie, The Legend of Boggy Creek? Quite a few. That's a good, that's a good amount. Um, it's something that uh, came out in the 1970s, and for the time, it was a huge sensation. It was uh, playing in theaters and drive-ins much throughout the 70s, and then later on television. So a lot of people sa uh, had seen the movie, and they, as I go around the country speaking about this, and I did many uh, lectures on the history of the legend of Boggy Creek and the case uh, of this creature that was seen in southern a Arkansas, uh, everybody would come up and say, man, I saw that movie. It scared the out of me. <laughs> Almost if they were quoting verbatim, just some line, and everybody would say this. So it was something that had a great effect on people just uh, bringing the Bigfoot subject uh, into their homes and uh, it also influenced a lot of people who big, do Bigfoot research these days, myself included. I saw this movie when I was a little kid in a drive-in theater, and it's stuck with me, obviously. And, uh, you know, I'm sure my parents are proud because I, I took that and I've turned that into somewhat of a profession here. So. But anyway, so the way I, I started with the premise of what I'm talking about now was that the legend of Boggy Creek, the Boggy Creek case was perhaps the most 
famous of the southern Sasquatch cases. And that was obviously because there was a successful movie made about these incidents. Now the movie, uh, the tagline was a true story, and it certainly was, because what you see dramatized in the movie are accounts that were based on uh, the reports from real people. Now the movie sort of dramatizes that and plays it up and does all that. It, it is a horror movie after all, but uh, at the root of that it was based on real sightings and and so uh, it was something that was just so famous and something that represented what pe most people's idea was of the southern Sasquatch. But I thought, you know, over the years I've done a lot of research, um, you know, I've read up on this subject, I've talked to a lot of witnesses myself, and there is a longer history of Bigfoot sightings all over the Deep South. And some of those are just as fascinating and almost terrifying as the legend of Boggy Creek. Now when I started to do this project, I thought, okay, I'm just gonna do the South, the South, and I'm gonna go everywhere and I'm gonna cover this topic. But I suddenly realized as I was working on this that it, this was a huge undertaking to research in detail the history of sightings in all of the what's considered the South is quite an undertaking. Now I've been to mo every one of these states before and done research in those states as well, but uh, I had to sort of narrow it down because the scope of these sightings was just so huge. And I don't think as many people realize that there has been this many sightings. So. Then I looked, uh, you know, to try to quantify this, I looked at the U.S. Forest Region, uh, region 8. Now the forestry breaks things up more in a geographical and ecological uh, mapping rather than states, you know, because after all, I mean, these creatures don't really care about our boundaries. They don't care what state, like, hey, I'm an, I'm an Alabama Bigfoot. <laughs> well, I'm a Texas Bigfoot and I'm 10 feet tall. You know, there was, there's really, they, they're not going to recognize this. These are animals and, you know, uh, quantifying them by states isn't really going to be accurate. So I, I thought this forest region, region looked good and then really just the reasonable scope of what I consider the deep, deep south ended up being this right here. So this is what my research has focused on uh, to learn about the history. One of the interesting things that you discover right away about the southern Bigfoot is that there's so many names that these creatures have been called. Now, uh, in the case of the Boggy Creek Monster, uh, you know, it was called Boggy Creek Monster because it was seen near Boggy Creek. It was also called the Falk Monster because it was seen near the little town of Falk, Arkansas. And when you look at uh, southern names for these type of creatures, you find that uh, there's many of these, and these are sort of the general terms that are used. You've probably heard a few of these, skunk ape, maybe swamp ape. Uh, wild man is one that's used a lot historically if you look at old newspapers. Um, but there's just a number of these names, and when you're looking back historically to, to do Bigfoot research, because, uh, you know, the term Bigfoot wasn't something that was used uh, prior to the late 50s. So if you're talking to your great grandmother about some sighting of a strange upright creature, she's not going to call it a Bigfoot. And they didn't call it a Bigfoot. They had no frame of reference for that. But they would call them these other names. Like a wood howler, skunk ape, bush ape, things like that. So as you look back in terms of potential Bigfoot sightings, you have, to look, you have to look for these kind of names. You can't look for big, the term Bigfoot. And I put together just, just some examples of some of the regional names that you find uh, all throughout. And you can find these in newspaper accounts. Uh, you can find these uh, in localized tales and stories that, you know, a guy says his grandmother heard, things like this. You know, of course, Arkansas, Boggy Creek Monster, Falk, Mon uh, Falk Monster. Um, Alabama, Guntersville Terror. Uh, one of my favorites over here in Florida is the Fair Villa Gorilla. <laughs> Love that one. You know, and a lot of these are creative names by the news media. Um, you know, 
Sandman. I'm not sure what that one is, but but a very uh, very fascinating. Oklahoma has a apparently has a lot of creatures up there, and it does have a lot of sightings. So naturally, there's a lot of uh, names there. Uh, the abominable chicken man, being being my favorite, and it truly it truly is a good story. I mean, it's a funny sounding name, but it, it's it, it is a good Bigfoot case. Uh, Tennessee, uh, Tennessee wild man, things like that. And of course, Texas, not to be outdone, has a nice list here of uh, monster names that uh, refer to these hairy, upright hominids that lurk in the swamps or in the uh, piney forests. Old Mossy Back, the Sabine Thing. We'll talk about that. If you've seen uh, the uh, show Monsters and Mysteries in America, that was one that. Uh, I was I was a story producer for that uh, television show for a season, and I'm I'm like, okay, you guys got to do the Sabine thing. They're like, what? I'm like, yeah, trust me, it's a good one, East Texas. So, you know, the, these names kind of give it some Southern flavor, and I just love that uh, in my writings. You know, where I'm talking about the Deep South. Yes, I'm talking about Bigfoot creatures, but I love that Southern flavor, sort of that, um, you know, part of a, a, a great Southern mystery. Now, one of the premises that you find in the Boggy Creek case, and one thing that was played up in the Legend of Boggy Creek movie was, they always travel the, the creeks. They said that over and over, and of course, the creature was sighted many times along the creeks. But this is one thing that makes a lot of sense, because creatures like this are going to need to stay close to water, sustenance, places where... Uh, the habitat is going to be able to support a large animal such as this. And so as you start uh, looking around, you could almost overlay a map of Bigfoot sightings and you will see a cluster of these that follow the creeks and follow the waterways around lakes and upon rivers. And it's interesting that that's where they're sighted. Case in point. Uh, I investigated something that happened along the Sulphur River. Now, this is Little Falk, Arkansas. This is actually Boggy Creek right here. It runs here, and this is, we're talking southwest Arkansas here. It's deep, uh, pine forest, hardwood forest, uh, and a lot of uh, bottomland habitats. And it runs up here, and eventually this all runs and feeds into this Sulphur River, and along which the Sulphur River has a lot of sightings of the Boggy Creek monster in this area. So in November of 2014, I get a call from a friend of mine in Falk who said, I've got a woman who claims to have seen a creature. And this was just uh, after Thanksgiving of that year. So I said, of course, you know, I want to talk to this woman, you know, uh, can I get in touch with her? And she was a little reluctant. A lot of these witnesses, you know, they're either traumatized by what they saw or they don't want people to think they're crazy but luckily I, I assured uh, you know was able to convince her that uh, you know this was you know I wasn't going to make her name public or whatever whatever she wanted I just wanted to hear the story so I went up there and I talked to this woman and what she said was that uh, this was the Tuesday before Thanksgiving and it was 10 a.m. in the morning now, where she lives is right down on the Sulphur River. So she's the, like the last house. This, I mean, she's so close to the river, like if you're driving home and you're sleepy or maybe you had a little too much to drink and you didn't turn into the driveway, you would just go right in the Sulphur River. That's how close it is. But she said that morning she was going to visit her mother in the hospital. So she got in the car and was driving out and it's just, I mean, this is a very rural, rural area, uh, not many houses, some trailers out there. Well, she got up a little ways and realized she had forgotten something. So she had to stop, and she kind of did a three-point turn. She turned the car around, and as she started going again, she saw there was something that had come into the road, and it was standing there. Now, her first thought was, there's a kid in a Halloween costume standing there, or a person. What is this, you know? And she's kind of looking. 
But then she said as she focused on that, she could tell this, this wasn't a costume. Whatever this was was covered in hair. She said it was only about five feet tall. It was standing fully upright. It was covered in dark brownish hair, maybe about three to four inches long. She said she could see it, the hair moving gently in the wind, standing there. And of course, it was moving this way out of a big line of trees and moving towards an open area. And I guess when she turned around, you know, caught, caught it off guard. Because conceivably, if this creature was coming out, you know, the woman had passed by and I guess it thought, you know, I'm going to cross the road. And so now it was caught right in, right in action. And it just looked at her for a moment and she said it just turned and ran very quickly back into those woods. Now the woman was obviously traumatized by this and as she said, as I saw it run, that's really when I could tell that it was an animal. You know, I mean, I, I, had, I was able to focus on it for some time and she said that, uh, you know, she pretty much ruled out everything else. She says, I don't know what I saw. I think I'm crazy, but I'm telling you what I saw. I said, well, ma'am, I'm, some, I'm, I'm a Bigfoot researcher and somewhat of a counselor because let me assure you, you're not the only person that has seen something like this. We can't exactly say what it is, but rest assured other people, other common people, sane people have seen these things. And so, you know, it, it to me was a, was, a great, was, was a great sighting because this is a woman who's not looking for Bigfoot. This is a woman who lives there. She doesn't even believe in Bigfoot. She still doesn't believe in Bigfoot even though she saw one. She just can't wrap her head around it. But uh, it, it's one that, that I find credible. She saw it at 10 a.m. This is, this is one of those instances where they saw it in full view, right in the road, in the morning, full light. Now to follow up on this account, I looked at the place where I saw it going across. I wasn't sure why it was moving towards a field, but field is where you have a lot of game like rabbits and things, and these things can move quickly. You know, it could get in that field and get back very quickly. I talked to the landowner who uh, owned the property there, and I discussed with him, I said, what do you think the chances are that some kids were playing a prank that day? He said, Mr. Blackburn, there is no chance there was any kids playing a prank. First, I'm the only one that has kids anywhere around here. Most of these are older people and there's no kids living here and they certainly don't play in this area. They, he said as well, this is 10 a.m. Tuesday morning before Thanksgiving. What kids, my kids and the other kids were in school. There's nobody down here playing pranks. He goes, these woods right here go all the way back over to Falk. There's a long patch of woods. And so this all added up to me to be a quite credible sighting. Now, like I mentioned, they always travel the creeks. And the cool thing about this was if you start going up the Sulphur River, and this was actually in Texas because the sulfur originates in Texas. So if you're up here, you're in the Texas area, and that's where this woman was. And this, again, reinforced that theory that these things would move along the creeks and that's what I started doing with my Beyond Boggy Creek. I just started moving out the creeks and the waterways to do the research. Rivers as well. There's a lot of uh, significant rivers. The, the Red River uh, Basin runs right through here, and that's what the Sulphur River is part of. And again, if you kind of look at these rivers, the Canadian River cutting through here, you're going to see a pattern of these kind of sightings. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have driven up to Oklahoma. You've probably gone to some casinos or whatever you were doing up there, and you probably crossed over the Red River. But when you're crossing over, you're thinking, man, I'm going to win big. I'm coming home with big bucks. And then when you're coming home, you're like, you've lost all your money. But you had a lot of fun. But next time you cross over the Red River, you can think about this. There's been a lot of sightings along that river. There's one that was just sort of dug up and came on the map recently from 1960. And this was at a time when nobody had Bigfoot on the brain. What happened was the Sherman Democrat newspaper had an article that said 
a man down there had seen a gorilla. And they described it as a gorilla, except for this particular gorilla happened to walk upright on two legs and walked for a considerable distance. They still called it a gorilla, and that's kind of the premise I think they were just assuming this guy had seen a gorilla. Well, we've done some research on this, and one of my uh, research partners actually went down there and talked to the son of this guy who had seen it. And uh, sure enough, he said, yes, yes, sir, my father saw this thing, and there was you know, a big hubbub about it in our little uh, community. This is a very rural community right off the Red River there. And sure enough, you know, there had been sightings by several people of this so-called gorilla. He said, I'm sure it was a gorilla. And, you know, he said, you know, why would it, you know, why would a gorilla be down here? You know, where would a gorilla come from? He said, well, I don't know. It was a gorilla and I think the police caught it. And he said, but he kept saying, it definitely walked on two legs. So here you have a case where people at that time don't have knowledge of Bigfoot they're seeing something the best thing they can do is quantify it with what they know it's big it's hairy it looks like a gorilla so those are interesting sightings uh, to me because uh, they they sort of reinforce the fact that people uh, were seeing these things you know prior to modern times 1965 I talked to another uh, family who's who the father had seen something right along uh, the Red River near Hooks, Arkansas, and he described it in very similar ways. Uh, just another example, these sort of sightings continue. In 2004, there was a hog hunter out there, uh, and this is, again, a guy, he's, he's a lifelong hunter, doesn't believe in Bigfoot, had never seen anything in the woods prior to that to make him think this could be true, but on this occasion, he was hunting sort of downhill, and a big rock comes rolling down. And he thought, well, that's kind of weird, you know, but he didn't think much of it until a second rock came down. And at this point, he looked up, and he could see this creature standing there, seven, eight feet tall, covered in hair, looking down at him. Of course, you know, that, he just lost it and got out of there as fast as he could. Uh, but this is a guy, another guy that I spoke to as well, and was adamant that whatever he saw it was not a bear it was not a man it was definitely in his mind a Bigfoot I call this real mountain monsters you may have seen a show called mountain monsters but this is real mountain monsters right here um, you know, people don't think of the South as having mountains. It's not something that people generally associate, but there are some mountain ranges and some significant foothills that are present. And one of these areas would be uh, the Washita Mountains that run from Eastern Oklahoma over into Western Arkansas. And that's an area that has a, a you know, a great habitat for wild animals an extremely rich environment. It provides plenty of uh, cover, food sources, things like that. This is just an estimation, but there's probably at least 800 sightings that have been reported over the years throughout this area. And some of these I've spoken to the witness personally, and my colleagues have spoken to many number of these uh, that have come out of these areas. Here's a couple of photos I took. This is from a mountaintop up there in the Washita's, and here's me walking along this creek uh, in the Washita's. It's a beautiful area, and it's one of those things where if people start talking to me about Bigfoot, well, how can this be? Where, where would they go, you know? I'm like, well, have you ever been to the Washita Mountains? Well, no. I went, you know, went down to the state park once at so-and-so. I'm like, you need to go up to the Washita Mountains, because when you get out in a place like this, you really realize how much room there actually is, how much space there is that these creatures, if they do exist, could conceivably flourish. The place where, just to get to that, there's a small highway that turns off. You, you have to drive about an hour and a half up dirt roads, treacherous dirt roads, to even get to this location to camp. 
And that's way out in the sticks, as they would call it. And, and when you're out there, you're sort of the, now you're sort of the uh, low person on, on the food chain there. There's bears that have been reported there. Uh, there's rattlesnakes. There's all sorts of things that are out to get you. Uh, my, my own personal uh, enemy, the chigger, <laughs> is there in great abundance. And I, I, you know, I don't ever see chiggers, but I'll tell you, they do exist. I can promise you that. So, so, but, but, but my point here is that there are places you can go. And so when somebody tries to tell you that there's no place for Bigfoots to live, go out in a swamp, go out in these mountain areas, and you'll find they are. They're probably not going to exist down here in the local area because it just, you know, that's not a place where you're going to see large wild animals. Although, there was a feral pig sighting in Bedford the other day. I'm like, feral pigs in Bedford? I mean, these things are taking over. But yeah, literally a, a feral pig. I, I proposed the name to, you know, we've got to give it a catchy na name, right? I, I said, how about the Bedford Boar? That sound good? But my friend right here, Mr. Craig Woolheater, who I call the king of Texas Bigfoot, he also proposed a good name, the H-E-B Hog. H-A-W-G. Yeah, H-A-W-G. Yeah, because, I, you know, and I do often say, and I've just said, they don't care for our boundaries. So he's like, you know, if I want to go on over to Hearst, I want to be the H-E-B Hog. So. so, you know, don't quote me on the fact that wild animals can't come nearby, but probably... Uh, in all probability, something that's uh, seven foot tall and bipedal and a little more reclusive is probably not going to be seen near your suburban and metropolitan areas. Now, when you look back uh, and start doing a lot of research, of course, Oklahoma has a lot of roots in Native American history. And one thing you want to look at uh, in terms of historical Bigfoot sightings is the fact that uh, did Native Americans see these things? Because obviously for them to exist, for these creatures to be real, they would have had to been here all along and therefore would have had to have been seen by Native Americans. Now, of course, we don't have a lot of written you know, documents from Native Americans. We don't have that sort of thing. We've got passed down stories. You've got uh, people who have recorded those and written them down, you know, uh, taking the oral tradition. But uh, the interesting thing that you do find that most of the tribes, uh, and of course the Pacific Northwest included, but in the South, the, the tribes would have names for creatures such as, uh, that would translate to things like lost giant the forest giant, hairy man, things like that. Now, they did have a lot of, you know, mythological and spirit animals, so it's often hard to be sure whether the creatures are flesh and blood that they're describing, but they certainly do have a record for, for interactions with creatures who would fit the description of Bigfoot. Going back to even 1849, there was a sighting in Curtin County when a hunter, a hunter had reported a uh, hairy primate-like creature in Oklahoma. So, of course, you know, this is providing, you know, a lineage of historical sightings to say that these creatures have been here all along. There was a sort of a famous, to Bigfooters, uh, case in 1851, a newspaper article that had described uh, some encounters near Greene County, Arkansas, up in that region. Uh, in this case, some hunters had seen one of these creatures chasing a calf, uh, apparently trying to snare this for food or what have you. But uh, uh, in that article, they mentioned that the, the creature had been seen other times. It was well known in that area, which you know implies that uh, this you know was something that had either been living there or had passed through many other times. So uh, it's something that you find in these old newspaper articles. 
from the 1800s and in those cases they always call these creatures wild men or the wild man or things like that. That was kind of the favored term if you look back at these articles from the newspapers from the 1800s, wild man. Now when we look back at, at those sort of things in terms of Bigfoot, you know, research, uh, you find that, you know, the descriptions are what we would call a Bigfoot, but this was again prior to the use of that term, so wild man was what was in vogue at the time. There, there's been a lot of studies <coughs> up in the uh, Ouachita's, there's a mythical area called Area X where a number of researchers have had sightings over, over the years and it's been well documented uh, just to give you one example but a lot of serious Bigfoot research has gone on up in the Washita simply because uh, there's been just so many sightings. Um, the Kayamichi Mountains are up there as well. Now one thing that if you've seen The Legend of Boggy Creek you know that uh, there was some incidents in that where the creature allegedly attacked some people. The climax scene in that movie, the, there's, you know, they're shooting at it. It was trying to get in the house. Uh, that's not something that is specific to that area. And that was based on uh, reports, you know, by a family there in Fout. But there's a case up in uh, the Kayamichis known as the Siege of Honabi, in which a family up there had reported multiple instances of these creatures coming around their home and they were becoming so aggressive that they were trying to get in you know trying to pull at the doorknobs trying to scratch at the windows it was so bad that the guys who lived there literally took up arms and were trying to shoot them so uh, several members of the BFRO went out there and investigated this and it it kind of spooked them because these guys were at this point so fed up with it and there had been so many sightings that it scared the uh, the wife and the children so much that these guys were just shooting all over so the BFRO was like hey I think you guys got it under control we're out uh, but but it's well documented and I also talked to uh, some members of this family and uh, the way it turned out was the the game and fish people finally came in and looked at this and they said we don't we don't know if it's Bigfoot or bears or what but uh, the folks had been storing some venison some deer meat out in a shed and apparently these creatures were coming around because of that so the fish and game said well why don't you get rid of that and quit putting venison in there and we'll see what happens and sure enough uh, the sighting slowly died out and that uh, that incident uh, you know dissipated but uh, it's an interesting place and a place where I, I actually went to that house I drove by it once these people don't live there anymore they moved out but as soon as I drove by some guy came right out the door like it's like radar like you know he didn't know why I'm slowing down but but I looked behind that house and it just literally goes off into a huge mountain valley I mean you're just literally on the edge of a primitive area so I thought you know this this could be a place where this kind of thing could happen. I've talked a little bit about swamp, swamp apes, and that is another place where you have a lot of Bigfoot sightings. This, is, uh, this shows you sort of the swampy regions of the U.S., and you can see how, how much of the swampy regions we do have over here in this specific area of the southeast, just a lot of them. I love the swampy environments, too, because... Uh, they're just they're beautiful they're a place that you know not a lot of people will go back into the you know into the remote parts of these um, they're a little bit treacherous but it's a place you know that that has that sort of monster vibe you know you've got the Spanish moss hanging down from the trees and you know when I was a kid I saw movies or Scooby-Doo episodes that always had that swamp you know and there was always a monster there and you know most you know legends and things like that are, are, are rooted in some sort of truth and I think they're you know naturally swamps look spooky but it's a place that is the perfect environment I mean there's so much uh, food source uh, it's not highly developed it's a place where uh, if these creatures do exist they could you know exist in relative uh, exclusion 
One of my favorite swampy areas is Caddo Lake. Has anybody been out to Caddo Lake in East Texas? Yeah, I mean, it's an amazing place. This is a, it's almost like going back in time, a primordial looking thing. I mean, you know, you don't, you don't just expect to see a Bigfoot, you might expect to see a dinosaur. It is very cool. It's, a, it's such a beautiful lake and um, a place I like to go. And sure enough, uh, there has been a history of Bigfoot sightings. Now, Cattle Lake straddles the border of Texas and Louisiana, and uh, stories in that specific area date back to the Caddo Indians for whom this area was named, and they had uh, tales of these lost, lost giants, as they called them. There's been a lot of sightings out of there. Recently, I came across one that I, I put right up there near the top of my list for all time best sightings. Now this individual, uh, I was fortunate to come across the story because this isn't somebody who uh, has told this story outside of friends and family. It was something that simply happened and I was lucky enough to have run, uh, become friends with his daughter and she knew that I you know, had gone to Caddo Lake and uh, had talked about that. She said, you know, my father, when he was young, saw something out there. I'm like, really? You know, she said it was like a Bigfoot. So I said, well, I've got to talk to your father, obviously. Uh, and so here, here's what he told me. He said, back in the late 60s, uh, we, you know, we were living out in that area and uh, him and his brother would go for days back in there in a place called Devil's Elbow. Now, if I'm a kid, that's where I'm going. He said, but there was not a lot of people out in this area uh, back then. And certainly if you take the, if you take the uh, canoe and go way back in there, you're not going to see a person for days and days. So they would go out there for the whole weekend. They went out there so much, they even built themselves like a little shack some some board just nailed them together something where they could just stay there and sleep you know and so he said one night in 1969 we had finished having a we had a fish dinner we had caught a lot of fish that day we had cleaned them you know thrown the the fish remains over there we had eaten a good meal and we had gone to bed in our little shack there he said some point in the middle of the night he could hear something out there he was awakened something rummaging around well if you've ever been camping you know you know that that raccoons are typically going to come around if you leave something out uh, so you know probably his first thought raccoons something normal but he did he did kind of peek out there to look and he he could see he said you know we weren't great uh, at construction so you know those gaps between the the boards of our shack and he said as I looked out there in the moonlight, I could see this huge creature standing on two legs. He said it looked man-like, but it was much more bulky and appeared to be covered in hair. So now, you know, his heart starts beating and he tries to wake up his brother. And so far, the thing is just going about its business. Obviously, it was getting to the remains of their meal. And he said, in the process of waking up his brother, apparently this thing either heard something or could sense that somebody was there and it looked right up and looked at him and now he's looking out and for a moment they just sort of stared at each other and then suddenly the thing turned and ran quickly and disappeared he said he wasn't sure about his brother but he said I didn't sleep one wink the rest of the night I try to imagine myself in that position when I was a kid I did a lot of hunting but I'm telling you that would have been a scary thing to happen. So the next day when the sun came up, you know, they uh, went outside, they looked around, they could see the area where the thing had run, it, there was a lot of broken limbs. They tried to estimate the height by looking at a tree. He said it was standing up, you know, about yay big. You know, they didn't have a, a tape measure or anything, obviously, but he said they estimated that it was about seven feet tall and they also found footprints there that had left. He said they were huge. They were man-like. It had five toes. 
They were huge. Now at this time again, the Bigfoot is not something you're really thinking about. He's just thinking, what was that? Just trying to quantify what it was we had seen. Because these are kids who had been out in the woods. They knew what a bear looked like, every other animal that you could potentially see in Caddo Lake. This one, they couldn't explain. Now one, one thing he said, the characteristic about the footprint that he noted, he said it had a very big toe, which was interesting and a very good point because there are quite a few Bigfoot tracks that you see this very big toe. Now again, this isn't a guy who's into Bigfoot research. This guy, you know, he, he's just telling you what had occurred. And for him to say that it had a big toe was was very significant to me because that was something that most people don't wouldn't know. If you were just making this up, you would just say, yeah, it was a big track. It looked human, but it was big. You wouldn't add the big toe thing. And in fact, I, I have this track right here. This is the actual, this is, this is that track. Unfortunately, you know, they didn't have any plaster. There was no way to cast their track. So I, I wish we would have had it. But uh, this is, this is uh, a track similar to that one right there. And you can see the big toe right there. So I thought that was highly credible that this guy had described that. And again, the way I found this witness was, you know, he's not trying to get on TV. He's not in any other way. It just was matter of fact, this is just what I saw. And I don't know how to explain it. So uh, in my mind, it's a highly credible sighting. Even the Sabine thing, I might point out, uh, I've had descriptions of footprints down there which also described it as having a big toe. And the Sabine is running right south of Caddo Lake. It's the same, very same area. So what you do is you, you end up seeing these correlations that sort of support each other. You know, the, a person or a witness or somebody in one, one area would report these characteristics and so would a person here. It sort of connects. Now, of course, you know, you move over to Louisiana, to Mississippi. Again, I found that there was a long history of sightings. And there was sightings uh, that date back many years, and there's modern sightings. So apparently, uh, you know, the Native American legends that you look at come out of here uh, also describe uh, hairy, upright creatures. Um, Rougarou is a legend from... Louisiana, although it's it's more of a of a werewolf type creature, it's a little more of a what I would throw into the urban legend kind of category. It's just something thrown about by grandmas and parents to keep the kids, you know, in line. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, there are a lot of you know legends of these these sort of creatures, cryptids in the area. Uh, just an example of one dating back in Mississippi, there's a newspaper article from 1867 in which they describe some hunters as having gone out and chased a creature uh, down to this Homochito River and had cornered it with their dogs. And it was some, you know, some uh, tussle ensued and they tried, it, they tried to ensnare it, but it eventually got away. But this was something from an 1800s uh, newspaper and looking forward there was a lot of sightings uh, in in the 50s and the 60s and 70s in the Mississippi area and they continued today there was a lot of uh, I, and, and of course I go into more of these sightings in detail in, in the book obviously but uh, there was there was some really haunting ones that that came from Mississippi and that was a place where I hadn't done a lot of research you know I wasn't aware uh, that there was so many sightings there until I really started looking into it. Now if you get over into Alabama, Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, you're going to get into the foothills of the Appalachian Range. Now the Appalachian is a huge range and it's the, the biggest one in the eastern por portion of the U.S. that runs down uh, for nearly 2,200 miles. And uh, you know this again would be a place where I would look for uh, 
the existence of these kind of huge creatures. It would be a place where they could live. Um, there's plenty of mountainous regions. If you've ever driven through the Great Smoky Mountains or places like that, again, you see these huge upland forests, these remote regions that just span out for miles and miles. And uh, not surprisingly, you know, you do have reports of Bigfoot creatures there. I talked to a guy that had an incident just back in 2014. This guy, uh, he had saved up his money and somehow manages, managed to have six months off and he was going to hike the Appalachian Trail. I mean, this is a man's man. He was going to hike the whole thing, which is, you know, a huge undertaking. Your average person, you know, is is maybe going to hike a leg of this. But no, he, he had arranged six months off and he was going to do this. He started in Georgia, near Springer Mountain, where the trail starts, and he ascended that, what they call an access trail, of which he said was hard enough in itself. After he told me about that, I'm like, I'm just gonna do the access trail and be done with it. <laughs> it was like, that was before he even started, you know, the, the huge trek. But, but he said, uh, unfortunately, my hike ended, ended very shortly. He said, on that very first day, I got up there. I started on a Sunday, so there was no other hikers up there. Once he got up to the trail and started up the, the main Appalachian Trail, by now he was already tired because of this, you know, the access trail was so rigorous. He said, it was late afternoon, he said, I, I just had to take a rest. I was getting a little fumbly, I was stumbling over roots, and I, I just, I needed a rest. You know, I, he wanted to get to the, to the next uh, camping area, but he had to stop. So he put his backpack down, he sat on a, a rock, and suddenly a huge tree comes falling right near him. Which kind of woke him up, that's kind of strange, but you know, there's a lot of trees here, certainly they fall, but he looked, it was rather green, which he thought was strange. So he got up and started looking around, and then that's when he saw it. It was a huge creature, about seven foot tall, covered in dark hair, and he said he could see it. The sun was coming, coming through the back, and he saw it standing there. Now he's alone out here, no one in sight. And so obviously he, you know, he became alarmed. After looking around, the thing moved off into the brush. He headed back, got his backpack on, started back up that trail. There was no way to go but up. He said, now I'm not tripping over any roots. I was, I was fully charged. He said, I'm up that trail, no problem. But as he went on, he got tireder and tireder and he had to take another rest. He didn't really want to, he said, but I had to. Again, he sits down. This time he's a little more wary, uh, but he sits down, and sure enough, again, he's laying there and he hears something moving. Now he looks down, he sees two of them. One of them was dark, the other one had sort of an auburn hair color. Well, now, you know, he's, he's thinking in his mind, you know, what am I seeing? What am I doing? What is this? And again, got his pack on. And this time as he takes off up the trail, the things are shadowing him through the woods. It was, they were basically stalking him, flanking him, staying down off the trail, but coming through the woods. He could hear the crashing. Well, eventually he makes it up to this little, there's these little shelter things you can put your tent in. And once he got there, he had no choice but to stay overnight. There was nowhere else to go. So he set up his tent. He said, I, I just got in the tent. I zipped it up, and I did not get out the rest of the night. He could hear something walking around. He could hear something out there. He never saw any lights. And the next morning, he didn't see any other tent. So he could only presume that it was these creatures. Well, the next day, he gets up, hikes to the nearest... Uh, station where it's another entry point to the trail, tells a few people of what he saw, of course they laughed it off, and he said, I didn't care. He said, I got somebody to drive me back down to my car, and I went back to California. That was the end of my <laughs> six-month vacation in one day, so. It goes into more detail in the book, but a spooky sighting, and here again, I've spoken to this guy a couple of times, and uh, you know, who would, you know, who would arrange, and this was his life dream, something significant would have had to have happened to keep him from uh, 
continuing that, that hike. Tennessee wild man, there's a lot of reports in Tennessee as well, and uh, often known as the Tennessee wild man. I think that we also did one on uh, Monsters and Mysteries in America on the Tennessee wild man. What they didn't tell you about, this is a really spooky one that uh, I found an incident that was documented in the papers in 1976 in which uh, a little kid was running out his back door and screamed and his mother looked out and she saw this big hairy hand coming over trying to grab the kid. She pulled him inside just in time. The father came running up and they saw this big ape-like creature running off into the woods. Which is spooky because up there in this area in Tennessee, the, the uh, Great Smoky Mountains, there's been a lot of mysterious disappearances uh, that have taken place up there. So uh, they were never explained. So there's kind of a connection between these sort of unexplained disappearances and the possibilities that Bigfoot creatures could uh, uh, have done it. Has anybody read the uh, 411 books by David Polites? Yeah, it kind of goes into that zone. Now, you know, people always say, Bam, the Bigfoot ain't real, where's the evidence? There's no evidence. We don't have one. Well, yes, I admit, we don't have one. But the case is still out. There are, there are pieces of evidence, though. There are things to show for this. Here's a piece right here. That's the actual picture. And this is what's known as the Elkins Creek cast. This is obviously uh, one of the larger of your Bigfoot casts. Uh, this, you know, whatever creature was walking on this foot has got to be huge. Uh, but the story behind this, very quickly, it was found by a deputy working for the sheriff's department uh, near Elkins Creek, Georgia. They had been getting some calls uh, from a couple who said something had been coming around their house night after night. Well, the, this, this deputy was always on duty at night. He would drive out there. By the time he would get there, whatever it was was gone. I mean, he had to, you, know, his, you could see his headlights coming down the woods for, for a long time. He finally said, well, can I come out here during the day and look for myself? I need to look in the daylight. So he took it upon himself to go on his off time, went down there, and started looking around. Because he... The police generally believe that it was people doing this, that it wasn't any sort of a creature. A lot of the incidents uh, seemed like some, whatever it was was very powerful. It had ripped off uh, the door of the shed, uh, things like that, trying to get into the, the feed. He was feeding his livestock and things like that. But the police pretty much thought, well, this is probably somebody with a uh, some illegal operation going on and maybe they're trying to run these old people off or whatever they were doing so but nonetheless they wanted to help these people out something was going on they could tell and he went down there and when he was looking in the day he could see a little game trail that went off from behind the property and went down to what was called Elkins Creek he thought well this would be an access point if somebody's coming up through this property this is probably where they would come so he went down there and as he's looking around, he notices down on a sandbar about four big footprints. They looked manlike, obviously, but they were huge. And one of them was right up on the muddy bank. He said he went down there, and as he got there and looked at the size of these, now he's starting to think, well, what's going on here? He said he, you know, unlatched his revolver and got really spooked. He felt like something was watching him. But he thought, this could be evidence. I've got to, you know, follow up on this. So he went up and he had his plaster kit in his car, went up, got it, and cast this very track right here. Now, this is a deputy policeman. This is not a guy who believes in Bigfoot. He's not looking for Bigfoot. This is what he ran across. He cast the track and very shortly after was transferred to another police department and he just sort of put it in his closet and that was it. Well, just luckily enough, uh, later on, he ran into some guys who mentioned they had done some Bigfoot research, and he said, well, I found a track that it looks like a Bigfoot track to me. I never could figure out what it was, and he showed it to them. Well, the track was uh, 
you know, when they, the Bigfoot researchers saw it, it's like, wow, this is amazing. So they sent it to uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, who is a, a noted uh, research and, and a, on a foot anatomy. Uh, he looked at it, and it was also looked at by a fingerprint uh, expert out of Conroe, Texas, by the name of Jimmy Chilcutt. Now, he, he had done a lot of police work and was an expert in, in fingerprint forensics, as well as primate foot anatomy and prints. He had done a lot of research into that. And both of those gentlemen, in their mind, this track came from a real living creature. They found evidence of what they call dermal ridges. Now, you're not going to see it much in this track because this is like a copy of a copy, maybe of a copy. But what they found, you know, you can you see a little bit, but uh, it's like fingerprints, dermal ridges. And they thought, you know, if somebody was trying to hoax this, they wouldn't know to do that. It's complicated. And that stands right there, the Elkins Creek tr track, in my mind, stands as an ex excellent example of evidence. So there is evidence, possible evidence, something we can show for this. Evidence that was found by police, not crazy hillbillies in the woods. Police. So at the far end of the journey, you come to the realm of the skunk ape. Now, if you've looked into Bigfoot research, I'm sure you've heard the term skunk ape. Now, it's something that uh, you see crop up all over the South. They call them skunk apes. Uh, but it's generally uh, something that is always associated with the Florida area, maybe the Everglades. Um, and it's a term that people have applied to these creatures because many times they're reported to have a repugnant, terrible smell. And... Uh, it was a term, you, we can't really trace it back exactly, but sometime in the early 70s, skunk ape was something that began to be used more and more in Florida uh, that were associated with these reports of ape-like creatures. Um, again, you know, you've got uh, Indian tales in the area dating back, uh, you know, to the times uh, when they were living there of these type creatures. Um, 1900. Uh, there was a newspaper report that was uh, reported people being terrorized by a shaggy creature that they couldn't identify. 1957 was really sort of the modern emergence of the skunk ape in which uh, several men saw something in this big cypress swamp near the Everglades. And the Everglades is in the southern part of Florida in a place that uh, has a long history of Bigfoot sightings in that area. And there's, there's often a debate to whether skunk, are skunk apes Bigfoots, are they one and the same? Uh, oftentimes the skunk apes have been reported as being a, a little more ape-like, uh, often even walking on all fours. Uh, and, and, you know, obviously living in that marshy wetlands environment. But the thing is, is if you really start to look into this, um, you do also see these creatures having been reported to walk on all fours in other places. I've got sightings in Texas and Louisiana where people said they were moving on all fours and then even stood up and then moved on two legs. So it's not really specific that uh, the four-legged quadrupedal gait is something specific to the Florida skunk ape. It just applies to the southern Bigfoot itself and sort of I mean, in some ways, confuses the mystery because it's just one extra trait that we're trying to figure out exactly what it, what it is. But again, uh, you have a lot of modern sightings. This is a famous uh, photo taken in uh, Mayaca, which is kind of in the southwest part of Florida. This was sent anonymously to the police in the year 2000, and it's been hotly debated ever since over the years. Is this one of these creatures. Some people say it's, it's a hoax. Some people say it's an orangutan or, or something thereof. Uh, there's been some debate, but unfortunately it was sent in anonymously and nobody has yet to been able to find the person who took this. They just sent a letter and said they just wanted to make the, peop the police aware of the case. So this is probably the most famous uh, of the skunk ape photos 
so far. And, you know, it's funny about, about this type of research because there's always, you know, some, some little thread or a, a crumb being thrown. I had a researcher, uh, a fellow researcher of mine who said he was at the post office and I guess he must have been wearing a Bigfoot t-shirt or something and some lady said, do you research Bigfoot? And I said, yeah, yeah. Got to talking. She said, well, I've got, I know the lady, she, she sent in the, the photos back in 2000 to the police. He's like, are you serious? I mean, we've been looking for this lady, you know, for 17 years. And, you know, she's like, oh, yes, I, I can try to get her to contact you. And he gave her the contact information. And he told me about it. I'm like, that would be amazing. And of course, nothing ever came of it, though. Uh, it's one of those things where in this research, you know, there's always that mystery lingering just ahead, just out there, the carrot dangling. Uh, but hopefully someday, you know, somebody will come forward and give us more information on this. The one thing I thought that was interesting just in talking about the Southern Bigfoot case, that you, if you look at this climate map, this, this dark green area here is the humid subtropical area. And we know certainly that great apes today do live in the tropic areas of the world. It's somewhere that can't, it's, it's an environment that can support an ape-like creature. So, um, you know, if, it's almost my research where these uh, encompasses is right in that same area. So it would make a lot of sense that uh, if creatures like this, if, if, they're, if they are of primate origin or uh, species thereof, this would be a place where uh, they could thrive because this is a somewhat of a tropical environment. Now, here's a picture of me in the Ocala Forest in Florida, a place where there's been uh, numerous Bigfoot sightings over the years. Um, and one thing I like to do is go to the place where people have reported these things. When possible, I don't just Google stuff on the internet and, and write books that way because I can't accurately uh, describe the area. I can't, I can't know if it's an area where a large animal could even survive. So when possible, I always go to these areas, take a look around for myself, and that becomes part of my research and part of what I offer uh, you know, in support that these creatures uh, are a possibility. And I certainly say, I never say I believe in Bigfoot. I, I've never actually seen one. I've heard some howls, I've come across what I believe might be a footprint, but I've never laid eyes on one of these. Now my hope, my life basically revolves around people calling me up, telling me they saw something that people say don't exist. So obviously I'm exposed to a great number of witnesses and evidence like these casts that keep propelling me forward, saying there's something to this. Like, like the, the guy I talked about that had the sighting at Caddo Lake. Sightings that I think are, are highly credible. This guy's not making this up. He saw something. What did he see? So I always say that Bigfoot is a possibility. You can't rule it out. We can't prove it, but we can't say it's not true. It's something that can, though it seems impossible, improbable, it's not impossible. Because under the right circumstances, if there are some ape-like creatures that have above average intelligence for an animal, that have adapted well to their environments, that are adept and skilled at being elusive, are mindful enough not to run out and get run over by a car, it's possible. But to the average person who just sees a few news clips on this or some ridiculous videos on the internet, sure, I understand being skeptical about it. But when you put yourself uh, you know, in the world I live in and talk to so many just people like yourself who just say, man, I don't know what I saw. I was telling you, I saw this with my own two eyes. The lady that saw it at 10 a.m. come out, stand right in front of her car. 
I could see the lady was like emotional about this. She wasn't just like, yeah, I saw this thing. There was something to it. So I don't know how to explain it, but I keep my mind open. And that's what's interesting about these mysteries. It is a mystery, and that's what makes it fun. So, you know, perhaps someday I'll see one of these uh, and, and can, can say definitively for myself, or, or a body will come forward. Until then, uh, it's just a great southern mystery, a, a world mystery, and something that I enjoy doing. So, I guess we got to, let's, let's do some questions, uh, because that always opens up things that I may not have covered that you may want to ask. Uh, this could be about Bigfoot, you can ask me about my research books, TV shows, anything that, that you may uh, have on your mind, and then we can, we can go. Yes, sir? When you were speaking at the Sherman, Texas incident, and you spoke to the son of the man who had seen it, I guess, All right. uh, you said that he told you the police had gotten this gorilla thing. Do you know anything more about that? Right, the Sherman Gorilla thing. That that's interesting because what what this guy said, and there's always bigger, you know, more than I can summarize in many of these. It's an interesting one uh, because he said that the police had caught this so-called gorilla, and so the first thing I'm, I said was, well, if the police caught a gorilla, this is big news. I mean, if the sighting of the thing got in the paper, if they caught one then it would be in the paper. Yet so far, we've been unable to come up with any articles uh, in the paper that say the police caught the gorilla. Now the Sun said, oh, I think I've got those articles, but you know, they're always, you can't find it or whatever, but I'm thinking, you know, the place where we got this on the microfish down there, there should be an, ar there should be an article. And where did a gorilla come from? People always say, well, you know, it was a circus train that crashed. When's the last time you went to a circus and they had a gorilla? You know what I'm saying? Like chimpanzees? Yes. And when's the last time you went to a circus and saw a seven foot tall, upright ape that can walk on two legs? I haven't been to that circus. Maybe the circus will still be going if they had those. So, yeah, it's something that uh, they see, they, they sort of, in this case, this guy was sort of rationalizing in his mind. No, it was a gorilla. But yes, it definitely walked on two legs for a long distance and they caught it, but there's no other records that caught it. It was just a guy saw a weird thing in the woods. Yeah. In your research, uh, either the Boggy Creek area or any, is there any particular months of the year, seasons, that you can track, you know, uh, the movements? Is there Right. Question is, do you see a pattern in the, the, the times that the sightings have occurred, and is there any movement in that? Uh, there's, you know, there certainly is uh, times when they're seen more. I find February to be one that there's a lot of sightings. January, February area, and, and that might simply be because at that point you can see further through the woods because when the foliage is in the winter phase, you can see a long way. You go down to Boggy Creek area in June, you can't see 10 feet. Something could be standing 15 feet away and you never see it. Um, is the general consensus that they're territorial or do they migrate? Well, I mean, everybody has theories about whether they migrate or not. I mean, I just don't see a, I just don't see it as mass migration. I see it more like uh, animals like a cougar or something that need, need a huge zone. They, you know, they travel miles and miles, you know, 20, 30 mile, square miles, they'll be seen. The same animal will be seen because that's, that's how they survive. If they stayed in one just little area, they would exhaust the food and the resources. So I think they kind of are more regional and stay in that and you do see these p patterns of sightings which uh, you know can occur regularly or you find you find the patterns of the areas as well as the times um, that they're seen but it's not it's not a, it's not dramatic enough to be able to go well you see this line you know to show a migration like buffalo or something yeah um, something I'm always curious about 
guys the uh, kind of description is like a variation on the theme. Obviously, they all have big feet. Yeah. Um, but is it possible that there are different species of these creatures? And so, maybe how many do you think there may be? Yeah, the question is, are there, a, are there different species of these? And I think, in my mind, Bigfoot, you know, just to have one type of primate in North America is already a jump. So I think what you find is if their, their variations are adapted to their environment, maybe not a completely different species, but a, uh, some that have specifically adapted to those environments. Because if you live in a swamp, and, you know, you're going to... You know, these are often more aggressive behaviors, and you know, I mean, if you live in a swamp, hot, sweaty swamp, you'd be that way too. If you're in the Pacific Northwest, um, it's a completely different environment. So I think they they would adapt, and that would that would explain some of the differences in the appearances as well as the hair coloration, because you have you have black, dark brown, uh, you know, gray, silver, all that. Well, they're just like humans. I mean, your age, you know. Uh, dictates your hair color, you know, and everybody's different. So, you know, if these are similar, it'd be the same kind of thing. Yeah, uh, but... Do you know what year most of them were sighted in? Like, or what place they were mostly found in? Like, North America, uh, South America, or something like that? Well, he's asking where they mostly sighted. Um, I mean, there's regions where they're mostly sighted, and they, and they typically correspond to the more heavily forested areas, areas where there's uh, water. I mean, if you kind of overlay a map on that, you're going to see that. If you look at, te let's take Texas, for example. Tons of Bigfoot sightings in Texas. Most of them take place in the eastern half of the state. You look over there in the western half, well, it's a desert. Naturally, this is not a place where these kind of creatures would, would be. They don't see bears over there or other things. So they do correspond to what I find is logical, logical places to see them. I mean, if people were just making up these stories, they'd just be everywhere. But they do generally, uh, along the Pacific Northwest, you find uh, the southern parts. Ohio is a place where there's a lot of sightings. Um, you know, but... Uh, they're they're all over North America, and then there's legends and sightings of these in South America. Of course, you got the Yeti um, over there in Nepal, and the, the Orang Pendic in Sumatra, and the Asian areas. I mean, so you find these upright hominids all over. More questions? Yeah. Uh, you said you've never seen one, but you've heard them. What's the spookiest encounter you've ever? Mm. Well, yeah, there's been a couple of really spooky times, and I don't spook easily in the woods. I grew up, my father had me hunting since I was, could walk. So, you know, been in the woods, and the woods can be pretty spooky. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd say <laughs> the spookiest time was we were on a bayou in, in Arkansas, me and another guy, and it was probably about 2 a.m., and we hear this weird howl come up. And at first I thought, that's the weirdest coyote I've ever heard. And, you know, then, then you're starting, you know, the boat makes noise on the duckweed and the water, so you're trying to be still so you can hear. And then again, about 45 seconds later, we hear this howl again. And now we're like, okay, that's not a coyote. That's, what is that? He's like, I don't know what that is. It does it again about 45 seconds later. Now we've heard it three times. Now we're narrowing it down. It's not, not anything we can identify. I mean, foxes make weird noises. Birds make weird noises. But this didn't sound like that. It was definitely not a bird. It was something, um, you know, bigger. Well, we wait. It never howls again. So, like, ah, man, you know, by now we've got the recorder's position. We're quiet on the water. We just sit there. And the frogs are just laughing at us. Gator comes by. So, oh man, that was kind of spooky. So we go back, went about half, that was probably about a half mile back down the bayou, back to our camp. We got out, got the boat up on the ramp, got back up. As soon as we got up to the, where we had our tents, and this is no state park, this is way out there. All of a sudden we hear that same howl right across the bayou channel. I mean, right there. Before it had been about you know, 100 yards way up, way up that bayou. Whatever it was seemingly had followed us down that. 
and now we could hear it right there. Again, it made three howls. We, we tried to record one of those, and it's, there's so much ambient insect noise, it's, it's not a great recording, but, but we were really spooked out that night. And, you know, by having heard it six times now, we're pretty sure that that's very possible. We just heard the Falk monster, so good, good times. What do you think about the uh, Killing Bigfoot program? <laughs> Killing Bigfoot. Well, I do know those gentlemen on that show, and people often ask me that, and, and I, I, the, there's the debate about whether you should kill or don't kill a Bigfoot. There's a pro-kill. There's hotly debated, of course, and in my mind, there's no doubt that in order to prove it at this point, you're going to need a body. Even if there's a great photo, everybody's going to say, oh, it's photoshopped. You know, there's too much capability now to hoax these things. So, um, <laughs> the killing Bigfoot, you know, people up in arms, I don't think they're going to shoot one on camera. These guys have been trying to um, hunt them for years. They're elusive. They're up against, you know, something that's uh, hard to you know, hard to hunt even if you were doing it full time. So um, the show is, I can tell you this, it is based on real reports. I mean, the, the reports, it's not a fake show and these guys are real Bigfoot researchers. They've done it for years and years. So what you see and what they say they've done is real. They're not actors, they're not any of that sort of thing. Um, but it, you know, it is controversial, but that's what TV loves. I mean, it you know, it, it, it kind of creates that dialogue and you've got these guys trying to hunt them. It creates a sensational show and, you know, television wants to play that up. So, you know, I don't, I've, I've only seen one episode, but, but I do know those guys and they're, they're, you know, they're legitimate. Yes? Did you go out and investigate on the uh, do I take, what special equipment do I take? You know, I'm not a real gadget person. Uh, I'm sort of more like Tarzan <laughs> motif. You know, I still, you know, when I was a kid, I, you know, put the knife between my teeth and crawled up trees. And I don't do that so much anymore. But, you know, I'm just, I, I just sort of put myself out there. Because I think the first step to this would be if I could see one with my own eyes. Now, I do take a camera because that's, that's highly important. Um, and I'll put game cameras out near the camp, uh, a small audio device, and we've oft often used uh, uh, thermal imaging equipment, which is really expensive, but luckily one of my buddies can borrow one from work, you know? <laughs> like, hey, can we borrow this? you got a home project, man. We're out in the woods, you know? But, uh, so, you know, we do take things, but we don't often, uh, we don't set up audio recorders all night and then go home and listen to you know like 20 hours of crickets you know and go which you know I may miss something that way but I think my idea is sort of that hunting approach the way I hunted deer in Turkey I want to see that thing and if I see one now I know they're there now I know where they are then I can start bringing in the you know the more high-tech equipment yep Mm -hmm. uh, they just seem to happen onto the creature there in California. And then now all these years later with so many people out looking for it that there's uh, not more photographic evidence. Yeah, that's a good point. So about the Patterson-Gimlin film, you know, the guys that had been able to photograph one, and here's, this is a uh, track cast from the famous, you know, Patterson-Gimlin Bigfoot, we should all know that. The Zapruder film of cryptozoology. <laughs> this is an actual track from that. And, you know, I, I do know Bob Gimlin very well. And I'll tell you, man, what are, you know, I, I can't find any holes in his story. Um, and he stands behind what they saw, I mean, back in 1967. But yeah, the fact that they've gotten that, you know, if that's a real creature and they got it on film, how come it's, you know, for 50 more years, it's it's not been able to been done again to that extreme. I can't explain that uh, other than, you know, it's like if, if this is already an endang endangered species as it is, you know, and there could just be simply be less of them. Um, and that was a, a time when 
uh, that was possible and as time goes on they've logged the heck out of that place you know and you know it could have affected these creatures so it's hard to say why we can't get another film like that but uh, you know there's there there are some things actually a follow-up to his uh, question is there anything today that you may see video wise that says hey that's kind of compelling or that there's something in that video there but do you have any reference there anything you can say that hey we've got something here maybe uh, there, I can't think of a video where I, I put a lot of stock into it. There's been a few that I think are better than others. And then there's a lot of them that are just, it could be a Bigfoot, but it's not helping because it's too shadowy or it's too obscure. And, you know, it's not going to raise the level of evidence. All those possible, you know, there's hundreds of photos where, you know, well, it kind of looks like one. We need a better photo. We need a better Patterson-Gimlin film. We've got to set the bar here and not not worry, you know, look at all those things. So I don't see a lot of, I'm looking for something better and I just don't see that right now. Yes, ma'am? What is your opinion on the Freeman footage? Uh, the Paul Freeman footage, my opinion. Uh, yeah, that's that's one I'm, I'm kind of 50-50 on. I mean, there's some issues with the credibility there, but it, it's also a, uh, you know, one that stands up better than a lot of films you see now. So, um, you know, it's it's one where without me being able to talk to the person, at least like in Patterson Gimlin case, I've talked to Gimlin many, many times. Freeman, you know, not having get a sense of that guy myself, hard to say for sure. So that I'm, it could be good stuff. Yeah. So Patterson Gimlin shot the film with a movie camera mm -hmm. and all the a lot of the researchers now are using digital cameras and, and that. Is there any indication or do you, what do you think as far as them possibly having um, heightened senses beyond what we do? Like could they see an infrared or maybe hear the whines of the electronic devices and then that might make them a little more elusive? Or yeah, the question them? is uh, the digital devices we're using to try to capture the film, could they be sensitive to, the, to that? And I, I think it's very possible because take uh, game cameras, for example. It has been proven that alpha male coyotes can sense the game camera and will avoid them. So if a coyote can do it, certainly, you know, presumably a creature who is of a higher intelligence like Bigfoot or has better faculties could avoid these. I mean, they could smell them, they can hear a high-pitched whir. There's no telling what their senses could detect. So it's not out of the question that, yeah, you can't get them on a game camera because they can, you know, they can avoid it. Avoid it. I mean, there's been places where I find a huge number of concentrated sightings by credible people put up a game camera and then there's nothing. I, you know, it's just hard to explain that other than they are able to sense these and for some whatever reason just avoid them. They're not natural things in the woods. They, they avoid it. All right, well, a couple more and we'll, we'll wrap it up here. How come there's no other evidence like scat or lost teeth or nails or hair or anything else? Where's the other evidence? Well, there are things like that. There are you know people submitting scat samples um, hair is something that's been submitted numerous times but with in the case of hair there's there's no comparison to compare it to there's no uh, control so the best you can do is say it's un unidentified there's been many cases where people have submitted what they believe is to be Bigfoot hair and they think that it's uh, they just don't know what it is it's not a bear it's not a cougar and it may have some primate uh, characteristics, but that's the best they can say it's unidentified. And there's a lot of those. Scat, you know, I mean, you're gonna need to do a DNA test on that. And, you know, now you're starting to, we're getting better technology and people can do the DNA cheaper now, but it's hard to get that stuff tested. Hey, I got this big pile up. Can you test this for me? Down at, you know, the Bedford DNA lab, you know, they're like, so it's just, you know, you're just up against technology and, you know, people say, why is there no bones? Well, I mean, how, when's the last time you saw a dead bear? And somebody, a hunter could have walked right by one, the bones, and saw one and 
thought it was a cow bone or a bear bone and just walked right by. So bones could have been found, and they just didn't know it. One more. Do they whistle? Uh, well, they're said to communicate in many ways. Wood knocks, if you've watched Finding Bigfoot, hitting the trees, you know. And that's, that's one thing that people theorize they, they do for communication. Howls. Um, people say they imitate owls. And uh, whistling, you don't hear a lot. There, there are a few reports of where people hear a strange whistling, even some sort of primitive language, but those are the fewer. It's more, more of your howls and your growls and things like that, and then the wood knocking. So, so anyways, uh, man, I really appreciate y'all coming out. I'm, this is very cool. It's great questions, and, and I, I love presenting this thing, and thanks to the library and Gene for having me out. Uh, I'd love to come down here and talk about this. If, uh, obviously, if you would like to purchase a book, I'd be happy to sign it for you. Um, I've got the tracks up here if you want to get a closer look or take some pictures so you, you, know, you can amaze your friends and family <laughs> or whatever. But yeah, we'll, we'll hang out, and, and thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it.